So um, in this talk, I'm going to present some observations of the BGP behavior under one structural condition. And I'm also going to present an analysis of what contributed to the observed behavior. This project is a joint effort between UCLA, ISI, IIJ, and UC Davis. You can download our full paper from our project website. Um, the URL is on the slide. So, first of all, um, we're interested in understanding how PGP performed during the Linda Wayne attack in September 2001. Um, I'm showing a plot of the hourly PGP update count received at the monitoring point RLC0. Uh, at Ripe and CC. Um, as you can see, uh, um, on September 18, 2001, between 12 p.m. and 1 p.m., the monitoring point received 50,000 BGP updates. But two hours later, they received about 1.5 million BGP updates uh, in, a, in an hour. So um, this is represents a 30-fold increase in the number of BGP updates received by the monitoring point. This evidence has been used by um, other researchers to indicate that global routing instability occurred during the worm attack. If you attended um, the Manoc meeting one year ago, you may still remember that uh, the Venice's Corporation presented this finding in their talk. So, in our work, we want to understand exactly what are the causes of this spike. And um, we want to find out whether this kind of spike really indicate that instability in the global internet. First of all, the spike could have been caused by the worm. Um, as one report from the Science Institute says, the mental activity started at about 1 p.m. Um, on September 18, 2001, and proceeded to taper off in the following hours. It seems that the activity of the room um, correlates to the big spike in BGP update very well. However, this kind of spikes uh, has also been proved before. It could, it could be caused by implementation bugs or protocol design problems. It could also have been caused by BGP misconfigurations, or we may find other causes. So what we did is to re-examine the data um, used by the previous researchers. What we did is to use the BGP update messages collected by the monitoring point RC00 at WIPE NCC from September 10th, 2001 to September 30th, 2001. This monitoring point has 12 BGP peers. It has three US peers. There are AT&T, Vario, and Global Crossing. Uh, it also has eight peers in Europe uh, and one peer in Japan. So with this diverse set of peers, um, we should have a good picture of what exactly uh, uh, happened in the different ISPs during the room attack. So in order to identify what caused the spike, we first classify BGP update messages and then identify the causes of each class. We first classify the updates into announcements and withdrawals, and the announcements are further divided into new announcements, duplicates, and implicit withdrawals. Um, we, we further divide the new announcements into BGP table exchanges and three other categories. Um, for implicit withdrawals, um, we know that each uh, route can be uh, composed of several BGP attributes. Uh, there are uh, the AS path attributes, MAD, and uh, community attributes. So if the implicit withdrawal 
change, doesn't change the AF path attribute, then we call it an F path uh, implicit withdrawal. If it does change the AF path, we call it a D path implicit withdrawal. Uh, we give an example of how we classify the PGP updates. First, let's suppose that at time P0, there is a session reset between the monitoring point and the um, peer ladder. Then um, at time P1, we receive uh, an announcement for the prefix 216 and 200.16.216.0. Um, since this is the first update for this prefix, after the session reset, we call it a BGP table exchange. And then we receive the, a withdrawal for this prefix. After the withdrawal, we received a new announcement for this prefix. And we can see that the new, uh, the AS path in this, uh, uh, in this announcement is different from that uh, announced at time P1. So we call it a new announcement with different attribute. It's called NADA. Otherwise, we call it a flap. So at time P4, we receive another announcement for this prefix. And we can see that all the attributes, the AS path and the community attributes, are exactly the same as uh, uh, the route announced at time P3. So we call it a duplicate. At time P5, um, we received an implicit withdrawal. You can see that this, um, the AS part, the AS path part, is different from the AS path part announced at time P4. So this means uh, we get a new AS path to this prefix. So we call it a D path implicit withdrawal. At time P6, we um, got another implicit withdrawal. However, um, the AS path part remains the same, but the com community attribute uh, is changed. So we call it an S path implicit withdrawal. So using this classification method, um, we plotted the number of PGC update messages we received every day from September 10th to September 30th. The red curve in this graph shows the total and the green curve shows the number of announcements. And the blue curve shows the number of withdrawals. We can see that um, September 18th, the room attack day received the highest amount of BGP update. Um, and September 30th received the lowest amount. And uh, one more observation we can make is that most of the BGP updates are announcements. About 87.3% of the total updates um, are announcements. And this number is even higher on September 18th. There, there were about 91% of updates that are announcements. So the withdrawals are indeed a very small portion of the BGP updates. Um, then we further classify the announcements into five categories. Um, in this graph, we show that um, how many BGP table exchanges we have on each day, how many implicit withdrawals we have on each day. So um, we can see that the implicit withdrawals are usually the largest component. However, on September 18th, the largest component is the BGP table exchanges. Um, and the, this category varies a lot. Sometimes it's the second largest component. And there were zero table exchanges on nine of the 21 days. Um, so, so let's take a more detailed look of the one attack day. So we break down the BGP updates on this day into five large categories. On the right, we can see that the largest component is the BGP data exchanges. About 30.2% of all the BGP updates are BGP table exchanges. And 
5% of the PGP updates are duplicates. Um, this is very surprising because none of these two categories represent real routing changes um, in the in the internet. So um, um, so we want to know what exactly caused these two types of PGP updates. And on the left of this pie chart, we see that uh, there are three categories. One is the new announcements. The new announcements. Um, this doesn't include the PGP table exchanges. And the second part is the implicit withdrawals. And the third part is withdrawals. We can see that the largest component in the real routing changes are the implicit withdrawals. It re represents about 38% of all the BGP updates. So we want to know what caused the implicit withdrawals. Now we look at the 2.7 million BGP table exchanges on September 18th. We found that they're caused by 30 session resets between the monitoring point and the peer routers. Um, on the figure, uh, in the figure on this slide, we show that exactly when those BGP session reset occurred. Um, each mark on this graph represents a session reset. The x axis is time and y axis represent different peers. So first we can see that all the session resets on September 18 occurred between 2.20 p.m. and 4.30 p.m. This is when the rain attack was the most serious. And the second observation we can make is that there is very obvious synchronization between the session resets. So in order to understand what caused the session resets, we chose the routes from the monitoring point to the PA routers using the uh, tools provided by RIPE. Mm. We can see that all the uh, routes to the PA routers share the same first two hop routers. Um, and in fact, the second hop router is actually one of the 12 peers of the monitoring point. We can see that whenever the the second hot ladder, R2, has a session reset with the monitoring point. All the other sessions would break. So this suggests that um, there are some serious problems near the monitoring point, and this caused the synchronization between the session resets of all the different sessions. Um, one more point I want to make with using this graph is that um, the monitoring point is peering with the peer routers using multi hop sessions. And we know that most of the, almost all the operational BGP peerings are direct peerings. So, um, in general, the multi hop BGP sessions are more unstable than the direct peerings because they are subject to the congestion and routing problems at each of the um, hops. So one conclusion we can make from this is that the monitoring process was obstructed by the worm, but we cannot claim that um, the same thing occurred in the operational internet. And now we remove all the BGP table exchanges because they're monitoring artifacts. So uh, we see a somewhat different picture. Um, the lowest point on September 18th is still 15,000 uh, PGP updates. However, the highest point becomes only 0 0.3 million. Um, it was originally 1.5 million um, before we removed the PGP table exchanges. And now the highest point becomes 0 0.5 0 million between 3 p.m. and 4 p.m. on September 18th. One more interesting point in this graph is that um, the highest spike is actually on September 25th. Um, there were about 1.1 million BGP updates 
received uh, to, between 6 a.m. And, and 7 a.m. on that day. So what this tells us is that the monitoring artifacts are very misleading. So if, if we don't remove those monitoring artifacts, then we cannot re reveal the real problem. And also that um, the BGP instability on September 18th is not the most obvious, is not the most serious. Then we uh, look at the duplicate announcements. It, they make up about 4% to 10% of all the BGP updates. However, they represent about 31% of all the BGP updates from AT&T. Um, we uh, talked to AT&T and we found that this is uh, most likely an implementation problem. Um, they are triggered by changes to non-transitive attributes. So for example, um, if the BGP route to a, a certain prefix changes and the only part, the part that changes in that route is a next hop attribute. The, um, and when the router that receives this announcement um, redistribute this route to an external BGP peer, it's going to remove the next hop attribute. And the remaining BGP update is going to be exactly the same. So basically the problem is that R2 in this graph doesn't check whether the change is to a non-transitive attribute or to a transitive attribute. So um, what we learn from this is that um, there, are some sa there is some saving in the implementation by doing this, but it increases the overall system overhead because all the neighbors of R2 has to process these duplicate announcements. Um, Okay, so after understanding what those um, what uh, caused those BGP table exchanges and the um, duplicate announcements, we now move on to the updates that represent real routing changes. First of all, we found that among those among all the implicit withdrawals, there are about 22 percent that don't have don't have changes to the AS path. So in other words, the AS path part remains the same, but the other attributes such, such as the MAD and community attribute changed. Um, we have a graph showing what's the percentage of implicit withdrawals um, that are S path for the three US peers. We can see that uh, at and is down at the bottom the, the road curve. Um, so it shows that less than 10% of the uh, implicit withdrawals from AT&T are as path. However, um, about 40% and 70% of the BGP updates from Vario and Global Crossing are as path implicit withdrawals. We don't understand exactly what caused this kind of difference, um, but we know that um, if if uh, if an ISP changes its MAD or community attributes very frequently, then its neighbor may um, have to alternate between several different exit points uh, very frequently too, because those NADs or community attributes are used mainly to uh, to uh, promote or decrease the pre preference of a certain route. So in other words, the neighbors, when they receive the S path changes, they they will ha they will have to um, choose another exit point to the to the same here I said to the same neighbor. So um, 
we would like to understand what exactly caused this kind of changes, this kind of difference. After we remove all the table exchanges and duplicate announcements and S path changes, we see that um, the lowest point on September 18th becomes 14,000. Um, and um, the highest point on September 18th becomes 0 0.2 million. And the highest point now is 0 0.4 million. The, the highest spike on this graph is still on September 25th. Um, now we want to know among the BGP updates that represent real AS level topology changes, uh, exactly um, how how many prefixes had, for example, ten routing changes? How many prefixes had only one routing changes? Um, and then there may be some prefixes that didn't have any routing changes at all. So we plotted the distribution for every tier uh, on every day from September 10th to September 30th. And this graph, what we're showing is um, at and distribution on September 18th. First of all, we can see that um, there is a group of, of prefixes that contributed to the total disproportionately. So uh, if we look at the last bin, the, the rightmost bin on the graph, um, all the prefixes in that bin had, more, uh, had a 10 or more routing changes. And there, there are about 2,500 prefixes in this bin. However, they represent more than 60% of all the implicit withdrawals. So um, this means uh, a small group of prefixes actually contributed to the majority of the real routing changes. This observation is common among all the peers in you know, all the days. The second observation we, we can make from this graph is that if we sum up all the things, um, we know how many prefixes had at least one route, one route change. And we see that only about 14.4% of the prefixes in the at and routing table had one D path change. So in other words, 86% of the prefixes didn't have any D-path changes. So in other words, we cannot say all the prefixes were unstable during the worm attack. We did observe some spikes in the D-path um, routing changes. For example, um, we, we show that SurfNet experienced a spike um, around 5 p.m. on September 18th. What we found out is that about 40,000 prefixes changed their path um, almost around the same time. And then the return to the original path shortly after the previous change. So this caused a big spike. One possible explanation of this phenomenon is that SurfNet, uh, the operational session between SurfNet and one of its peers probably broke uh, around this time. And the session came back uh, shortly after the session uh, broke. So all the other routes that previously used that peer as the next hop has to change their path. And after a while, they have to switch, they have to return to the original path when the session comes up. So this shows that um, if, if our explanation is correct, 
this shows that there were uh, there were operational purine sessions that broke on the worm attack day. However, based on our, our observation that these uh, spikes were not frequent, um, so um, we can probably say that the frequency of uh, the session reset of the operational sessions were, was not as high as those between the monitoring point and, the, and those peer routers. So now let me conclude um, the presentation. So first of all, we found that excessive session resets at the monitoring point contributed most to the spike. This is a monitoring artifact. If we are not careful when we, when we are looking at the data, then we may arrive at the wrong conclusion. Um, the, second uh, the second conclusion is that a substantial amount of BGP updates don't reflect AS level topology changes. For example, the um, duplicate announcements and those S path implicit withdrawals. Um, finally, we can conclude that the, um, there, there were a small group of networks that are probably seriously affected by the worm attack. And um, BGP allowed those uh, local changes or local unreachability to propagate to the whole internet. And this is why we saw that the majority of the routing changes were contributed to, by those small group of networks. So um, there are mainly three uh, or four related studies. Lapovitz uh, and other people studied BGP pathologies before. And actually, our study also found some of the previously um, uh, identified problems. They still exist in the uh, internet. For example, the duplicate updates. Mm, the, sec mm, the second and the, the third related study is uh, about the BGP behavior under congestion. And both of these two studies showed that when they exper exper uh, experimentally increase the congestion, the network congestion level, BGP sessions will break. Our um, empirical observations seem to uh, support their conclusion. Um, and this, the fourth related study is by uh, Man Manel and Feldman. They analyzed BGP traffic characteristics um, to produce realistic BGP traces. Um, they also identified some characteristics uh, that we see in this uh, study. However, their main purpose is to produce um, BGP traces in test lab environment. Our main purpose is to diagnose problems in the BGP traces. This is a list of references. Um, so this is the end of my talk. So can I just postulate one thing, and that is in the event of something like Ninda rolling out, Mm -hmm. You may not have actually been observing the BGP session dropping from congestion per se, but it may have been uh, an overly active engineer at a particular ISP or a set of ISPs going, oh my god, I've got this whole bunch of traffic going through, I don't recognize it, are they flooding us, are they attacking us, let's tear down the session and see what happens. Oh, the yeah, traffic that's right. in another way, let's bring it back up. Yeah, that's also one possible uh, scenario. Yeah, it could be congestion or a uh, router reboot. But but, yeah. I, I'm actually postulating that, that in a lot of these cases, it's the humans 
that inject the instability that the routing protocols, if left alone, may actually weather the storm better than if we as engineers start getting involved and poking our fingers at things to maybe try to make it better. No, sir. Just an observation. We went back to the operators of a sampling of the sessions that were reset. That was the only session reset on the routers, and it was not done by hand. Um, realize also that even if they'd gone to reset sessions, they wouldn't have chosen to reset this one because this is a multi-hop EGP peering to a research peer where no routes are really being received. So it's uninteresting for ops to reset it, though of course, if you are silly enough to allow fingers on your routers instead of configuring things automatically, anything can happen. Uh, yeah, just minor comment. So you focused on a spike, but it's not about the spikes really. I mean, if you looked at the withdrawals uh, after cleaning up the data, the interesting thing is the sustained level of withdrawals. It's about factor of five or so higher than normal, going for about 24 hours. And I think it's quite feasible that it may be several thousand networks. There's no more really involved. Another thing that's interesting is I don't think you looked at Code Red at the same time. Now, Code Red does not have any uh, artifacts related to session research. And it has a pretty similar general behavior, too. So uh, I think that uh, I think we're digging in is not sort of you know to filter out uh, what you call S paths, meaning uh, updates that do not change AS path attributes, but to ask the deeper what exactly caused it, and why do you have so significantly higher level of uh, updates that reflect internal changes in ASs rather than uh, external BGB paths. So I think we still don't have a clear-cut answer. Uh, what exactly? has been going on. Yes. And I want to stress that the spikes don't matter here. It's the, let's not confuse, you know, the tree for the entire forest. Yeah, you are looking at one subset of the PGP updates, that's the withdrawals, right? You are saying there's um, increase in the withdrawals. And oh, yes, the last, quite considerably, yeah. Yeah, we, we don't contest that there's increased PGP writing instability, but we want to know whether the instability occurred all over the internet, or are they contributed by a small set of the networks or not? Yeah, I agree. It's, it's, it's several thousand networks, yeah. Yeah. And one more clarification I want to make is that although this worm didn't cause um, widespread damage to the BGP routing protocol, the next worm may, may do. So we are not saying that we shouldn't be concerned about um, BGP problems. In fact, one of the reasons we look at this problem is trying to identify what are the weaknesses in BGP that we, we have to improve or fix in order for the protocol to be more resilient to the next worm attack. So as we have heard in the previous talk by Ron Petson, there could be a, lot, a, a, more, a much more powerful worm. So when that worm comes, we want to know whether BGP is ready or not. So um, there's one uh, aspect of this study that's to identify the BGP weaknesses. Uh, I'm not emphasizing that aspect a lot in this talk but you can find it in our full paper. So thank you. Thank you.